for today. Thank you very much for first of all for inviting me to speak about this topic today. Um, so it's a couple of tricks or tricks that we use in microsurgery that should be quite handy for us as microsurgeon to use and everything. Uh, the first of all is the arteriovenous loop. Uh, it's uh, been introduced by Threlfall in 18, uh, 1982 as a case report, and then it was popularized by Granger in 1987. Its uh, technique involves creating arteriovenous fistula with a vein graft and using uh, mostly the long saphenous vein graft in lower limb cases. This technique is more superior than using interpositional graft for many reasons that will come in later into the presentation. This diagram here was the first diagram being published in 1982 about how to uh, establish a vein loop. After then, there was many publications through, through the years that has been focusing on the technique. Most of them were case reports and small case series. Was even described as a two-stage reconstruction uh, for diabetic foot to bypass the diseased vessels. And, oh, sorry and has superior result at the time in comparison to interpositional grafts. Until newer generation case series uh, were published by Cavadas and Len that made the concept be solid in the hands of microsurgeons and well utilized. The technique itself is, as I previously mentioned, is creating an arteriovenous fistula with a vein loop, usually the long saphenous vein. The midpoint of that fistula is located near the defect and is divided to provide vessels for arterial inflow and venous drainage. The term loop itself sometimes can be confusing for junior doctors. So the loop is a mean to achieve pedicle length and to provide uh, arterial inflow and venous drainage, so it's to provide recipient vessels. It's not kept as a loop. We divide it at this point where the arrow is. There are two types of the loop. So there are pedicled AV loop where the venous end is left in situ in its bed and only one arterial anastomosis is performed. And then there is a free AV loop where the contralateral uh, long saphenous vein or contralateral vein harvested from the other limb and an arterial and venous anastomosis, both of them are performed to the recipient vessels. And of course, as plastic surgeons, we love classification. So someone came up with one, although I'm not sure it's relevant for any clinical practice. The current debates for it now is uh, mainly about the superiority of one um, stage over two stages and vice versa. Advocates for one stage say that um, it only takes one hour of um, flow to maintain the good flow through the loop and causes untwisting to the vein and expand it to the functional size. Well, decrease the risk of the steel phenomena due to the drop of the blood pressure through the flap because of the AV loop. It also reduces hospitalization. The advocates for two stages would state that uh, performing the loop under local anesthetic can reduce operative time and reduce the risk of swelling to the flap and the surrounding tissue after 10 to 21 days. Some other authors would claim that three to five days is enough uh, for the flow through the loop to be at its highest. When it uh, comes to the advantage of AV loops over interpositional grafts, it can confirm adequate blood flow. It can, uh, uh, the loop can be confirmed that's working and there is no leaks present at the time. In addition, after flap insect, the point of the division of the AV loop can be decided based on the length of the flap pedicle. Most importantly, after the introduction of the arterial flow uh, into the graft, the true size of the vein graft is realized. It allows a more realistic, um, and appropriate decision about the size match and the size of the recipient vessels. Further advantages uh, is early detection of the steel phenomena, especially in patients with vascular disease and bone limb perfusion. For my practice, we uh, normally use the AV loops um, in certain situation, extensively around the knee, although the genicular vessels are uh, mostly around 
and my experience with them is with my mentor, uh, Mr. Khan, when I always joke with him that it always work when he's around. If he's not around, the genetic vessel don't work for me at all. So I use that vein loop to do the reconstruction at this point. We use him to get away from the zone of injury with a short medical flap. And we use him for perineum magna. And we have an algorithm for dealing with these cases that we hopefully will publish soon. Uh, we use them also for lateral lower leg defects where short medical flaps. On time. A uh, bit of technical aspect or tips uh, for using the uh, AV loops. We are always prepared to have a plan for which recipient vessel we will use. So if we are planning a vein loop to work, uh, we can get a CT angio. And it's a common practice for us to find out if the loop is going to be the recipient vessel of us, we can start working on that early on. If I'm using a vein loop, I will use it on a high flow vessels, either popliteal or femoral vessels, for the reason that will come up in the next slide. A tip that I learned from one of the vascular surgeons is do not do a single large incision uh, for harvesting the AB loop. Uh, just do um, a bit of a smaller cut, smaller incision with a normal um, skin bridge or leave a bit of skin bridges in between. And that helps for the wound healing because if the wound breaks down, it will be a quite big problem for it for us. So just smaller incision. Also, just to realize that the Doppler signal takes some time to pick up. So don't panic if you it's not present or weak to start with and make sure that you're happy with other clinical parameters. A couple of boring slides about uh, physics that explain the flow through the AV loops. Uh, boys here's lows uh, that is uh, just increase the Kundui lens would lead to a decrease in blood flow and increasing the vein graft diameter and or the inflow pressure can increase the blood flow. Ohm's law for uh, flow, for hemodynamic flow through the vessels, decrease flow with increased resistance, which is seen in long vein grafts, and also high flow pressure should be used to increase, to uh, overcome that resistance. This is uh, our first case just to explain the, what we use in trauma. So this is a traumatic defect after an open tip fib fracture in a patient with a uh, peronea arteria magna. As you can see in this slide here, there is only a nerve without any vascular uh, pedicle. So we did an arteriovenous loop to the um, long, through the superficial femoral vessel. And the way I set up for that is putting, by putting a couple of self-retaining retractors at the proximal and distal end of the um, incision and passing a sloops, vessel sloops on the proximal and um, distal ends of the vessel. And that allows us to control the flow and be able to do an end-to-side anastomosis. And as you can see here, the loop is formed and we pass it subcutaneously just to the pedicle where we did a gracilis flab at this point. This is a second case of a six years old child who had previous ALT flab on a single vessel limb and he needed a wrist fusion that we used a vascularized uh, flab on it. Uh, vascularized DCIA flap. So we performed a free AV loop, uh, this slide, and we connected that, we brought that pedicle into the defect, onto the bony defect, and we performed a free DCIA to fuse the rest at this point. The second part of the presentation is regarding flow through flaps. And the concept of flow through flaps in which uh, the proximal and distal end of the vascular medical of a free flap are anastomosed to provide blood flow to the distal tissue was first described by Sotar et al. in 1983, where he used a radial forearm free flap to establish an uninterrupted arterial flow between the external carotid and the distal facial artery for head and neck reconstruction. Followed by Fauché, where he uh, performs a report of an extremity reconstruction with a simultaneous vascular defect using radial forearm free flap. 
the principal advantage of this flap that provides an opportunity for a single stage uh, composite reconstruction of post soft tissue and vascular defects, making it particularly useful in reconstruction of ischemic uh, extremities and defects from oncological ablation. Again, because we love classification, there is a, a non-clinically relevant decision to the decision-making classification. Just to avoid the confusion of it, uh, type three of that classification is a reverse in the flap. Commonly used flap is a radial forearm flap, uh, despite the donor site morbidity and having to sacrifice a major limb vessel. And the ALT flap is the winner uh, with over 20 different publications media plunder flap, and a special entity is a venous flow through flaps, which is a separate entity I'll touch on later on the presentation. The ALT is a favorite because it's a robust, well-known flap that's been utilized, and the descending branch by itself can provide a 20 centimeter vascular defect reconstruction. The indication uh, in our practice, so in my mind, the application of uh, flow through flaps in major limb trauma is very limited because following the BOA and the PAPRA standards, these injuries would require stage reconstruction due to the evolving nature of the trauma. And we end up doing a revascularization of the limb in the first stage, followed by the soft tissue coverage in second stage. But it has a major role in oncological reconstruction where the resection margin would involve a major vessel. So the indication in my practice would be for digital revascularization, providing blood supply to a second flap, uh, if in case of a limited recipient sites. And the least uh, big indication for me is to reconstruct an injured vessel uh, in an otherwise vascularized limb. There isn't uh, many uh, publication about glabrous uh, flow through flaps. There's only a 12 case series uh, by chat. So this is a case where um, hand trauma where it had a seven centimeter neurovascular defect, de defect with multiple fracture, soft tissue loss on the volar and dorsal aspect. We uh, did a neurotized uh, media planter flow through flap with, um, to revascularize the index and bridge the gap in the digital nerve. I was a fellow at the time and Mr. Henderson, uh, one of my consultants in Bristol was the main operator. And the plan was to use a flow through flap to revascularize the index and at the same time with a digital, one of the nerves passing through the flap that can provide the um, neurotization of the digital nerve. Uh, this is a second case with severe forearm degloving and a single vessel limb. So we used the ALT flap as a flow through to provide blood supply for a second ALT flap. And one of my clever, more clever colleagues, James Warwick Smith, uh, did a babysitter nerve transfer or a nerve tra transfer to the ulnar nerve because it was damaged proximal to the injury. The third case here was an ALT flow through flap to a lower limb where the vascular surgeon got their hands on it first. And although it was a vascularized limb, they used a vein graft to reconstruct the BTA, which unfortunately didn't work because of the zone of injury. So we used an ALT flap to reconstruct the posterior tibial artery. Just because we're talking about the flow through flaps, I thought I would mention the shunt restricted arterialized venous flow through flaps. It is a cutaneous flap based on the subcutaneous veins, most often using veins in the forearm with no identifiable artery. It can be useful for small defects as it's a cheap donor site and it's not good for revascularization of digits. And has a bit of a learning curve to uh, master how to control the arterial inflow into the flap and prevent congestion. It's something that we are trying to get on to ourselves. So. So an example of this case is that uh, electrical injury where he had a um, volar and dorsal defect with loss of one of the digital arteries and digital nerve. So we used the flow through flap with arterial inflow with um, the digital artery. And we used the venous drainage on one of the dorsal veins. And as you can see, the almost normal capillary refill through it. And via the same access to harvest the flap, we harvested some nerve grafts. 
This is a case just for a traumatic defect in the sum, just to show the relative donor site morbidity or limited morbidity of that flap. So it's relatively achieved donor site morbidity. I think that's uh, it for my presentation. Hope it was useful. And thank you very much for having me. Very happy to be contacted for any question. And if anyone uh, is going to the WSRM, uh, my colleague Nick Marsden, I would be delighted to meet you there. And many thanks to my colleague Stephen Ali, who played the very important role of being sci hub to get all the presentation, all the publication that I used in this presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. No, you went beyond. It's amazing. Oh, blown my mind. Can I start with a question about CT angios? Do you just yes. uniformly do that for every lower limb case? For every lower limb case, we just like to know which recipient vessel we're using beforehand. So it helps us in planning the recipient. We don't use it to plan the flap. We use it for mainly for recipient vessels. So Ahmed, I'm not, I'm not clear at the moment. You, you discussed the kind of relative pros and cons of um, doing it as a single or um, two-stage procedure. The AP loop. What do you do? What have you we, we do a single stage. I you think the, stage? yeah. We, because we use it mainly in trauma, we don't have that luxury of being able yeah. to do a two-stage right. approach. So a single stage for us is a, is, is a way for it. And have you found that the uh, disadvantages people have talked about in publications to be true in your, in your experience or not really? I think the flap is going to swell regardless and there will be swelling in the tissue regardless. I don't think we can, I can personally do a loop under local anesthetic. So I don't think that will save any uh, operative time for me at all. So a uh, single stage, I think, was uh, we saw the benefits of that. Yes, uh, we leave it for running for an hour before doing the flap. So it untwists itself. It takes its normal size and, of course, reduce hospitalization. Fine. OK, so, then, so you do the loop as your first thing. And then whilst it's, it's got the, you know, you, you leave it for an hour, are you then raising the flap at the same time? We're so raising the flap at the same time. Yes. Yeah. So the loop, we start with the loop as, as, a, as the first thing, just to make sure that we have recipient vessels. And you said that doing it as a single stage decreases the chance of a steel syndrome. Why is that? Because it will show you in the, because when you do the vein loop, it, uh, the flow in the vein graft is less. So the pressure, the flow pressure in the vein graft is less. So it does not take much pressure into the going through the flap instead of passing through the, the normal vessels of the limb. Because it has to do that circulation in a long vein graft. So the, the pressure of the flow is quite less than, than passing through the flap directly. Okay. I'm a little bit interested to know about your journey because you said that you always do it as a single stage. Have you tried it as a two stage and found disadvantages there? We no, we we haven't. Yeah. So for for disclosure, yeah, no, we didn't do a sing two stages because we normally did not have that luxury of having the theater twice for a patient. So we are guided by the limited theater capacity that we have. But as you say, if there's a trauma scenario, you want it covered in ASAP, don't you? Yeah. Um, yeah and, and so the, oh, I had a question. For, oh, yes, about still syndrome. So, I mean, that that's really a, a difficult one, isn't it? We, we've come across one where we had a chap who was um, had a kind of chronic infection of the tender Achilles. Um, and so it wasn't a kind of acute trauma situation. Um, but we, we put an um, ALT on there. Um, and because he, he had ulcerative colitis, so he had a kind of lifelong steroids and horrendous peripheral vascular disease. Um, and, and we ended up giving him still syndrome, which eventually, after months, kind of adapted itself and he no longer um, had that. I wondered, have you come, have you had experience of still syndrome? And if so, how did you deal with it? I, I, I've, I've, see, I've seen it once and the way because the way I trained was how to avoid it from the start. So even if we're yeah. doing a normal flap, we do a very small arteriotomy to reduce the pressure going to the flap. So we do a much smaller arteriotomy than the recipient vessel. And this is the way that I was trained in how to avoid it from the start. And when we had that case, it was most probably because we did the arteriotomy quite large and that led to the most of the blood going through the flap rather than the leg. And ju just one more question, if I may, before yeah, the questions now um, um, from the audience members. 
Um, but um, can you, you you talked a bit about your preferred um, vessels that you you like to use? So you you said, can you just go through that again? So your superficial femoral artery. So I, I go for a high flow uh, vessels like the superficial femoral artery or the popliteal in the lower limb. So I don't. And the, and the, the, sorry, what's the second one? Pop popliteal. Oh, the popliteal. Okay. Yes. The endocytal. So I don't you... necessarily on on to side on them. Yes, and to side and on then, superficial femoral or popliteal. Yeah, and then on to any particular venous system, deep vein? So um, mo most of the AV loops we do, we do them as a pedicled AV loop. So it's a long saphenous. We harvest it all the way down to the foot and we use it as pedicle. So we, when we connect the flap, it's connected to long saphenous and the recipient artery. If I'm using it as free, I would do it and then to side to the adjoining vein. And you talked about pedicled and free. In your practice, are you more often doing those free or? In, in lower limb, if the long saphenous is present, we do it most most of the time as a pedicle. We use it free mainly in the upper limb. Okay, so look, there are lots of questions here. Can we... Yeah, yeah. I'll start with one uh, from Ravit Yanko, because I was going to ask the same question myself. So I asked you about the CT angiogram, uh, CT angiogram, yes. and the question is, how often don't you find that your planned recipient vessel, according to the CTA, is not there or not flowing as you had expected it? So in other words, how reliable is that CTA for your surgical planning of recipients? I think it, uh, so for our experience, only the if with 13%, we had to change the plan for the recipient vessels. Uh, and it's based on the CTA. So on clinical examination, for, for example, we have, yes, palpable pulses and uh, we have Doppler. But when we look clinically at the, the vessels were suitable. So actually the CTA avoided that 13% of changing the plan. So you found it to be very reliable. More, more reliable than clinical examination. And we always, as per trauma guidelines, we try to avoid the zone of injury because we know even though the vessel seems to be intact on the scan, but it might have some intimal damage or interruption and or bad flow at this point. So we still always go so more proximal or distal to the zone of injury. And, and do you prefer CTA to MRAs, for example? Uh, I think CTA is mostly also because it incorporates the bony element that the orthopedics have, would like to see. So if they would like to have a proper assessment of the joint, so it goes as one scan. Also in where I worked, so when I used to work in Bristol, the CT angio was part of the trauma CT scan. So the patient gets a head to toe exam CT scan and we ask for the CT angio to be done at the same time. That's really interesting Dave, because we, we are not a major trauma center here. So the kind of preflux we tend to do. Are... We, we have, yeah, we have a different approach now in class. Mm. So they like to do the bastion uh, series. So they stop around the knee. So we have to unfortunately do a separate CT angio later on for the leg. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Because, so because they, I was just going to say the, um, the types of people we do free flaps on in our unit tend to be kind of older people with you know, diabetic feet and that kind of thing. So, so we found that CTA are better picking up people with the calcification within the vessels than MRAs, but even then, sometimes they are not so reliable because it doesn't give you any information about flow. So a duplex um, ultrasound is sometimes quite useful. Yes, or just a, yes, or yeah, well, it's just operator dependent. Yeah, we're trying to learn how to do it ourselves at the moment, but just operator dependent for the duplex ultrasound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, Okay, so we have another question. I'm going to move to a different area from Mode Hatemla. With flow through flaps, how do you compensate for diameter mismatch? Uh, for diameter mismatch, if we're doing so, we can make it like a blind end vessel and we still use uh, an end to side. So we can clamp the end of the vessel and anastomose is an end to side proximal to that. Presumably, so you do a lot of skip flaps, don't you? Ahmed. So the yes, um, I would have thought you need to do that quite often for your skip flaps. 
Distally. So for right. skip flaps, if, if we're doing, yeah. if we have an end vessel, for example, if it's yeah. going to end to end and a smaller diameter vessel, we would just clamp the distal end of the vessel or put a clip yeah. on it and do an end to side. Right. That works What's about on the veins? Uh, on the veins, it most likely most of the vessels that we get will will have a good mismatch. Still can do an end to side venous anastomosis, but we didn't encounter that much. I only had it once doing onto uh, femoral vessels directly, and we did an end to side anastomosis. Question from Saf there, Ali, a very good one, actually. So for your AP loops, how would you make sure that the loop doesn't compress in the tunnel or the tissues as it travels underneath it? Just, just make a, so we don't make a big incision, but we make a big tunnel, so we undermine it quite well. I leave a bit of skin bridge, but to just make sure that we're going subfacial, left all everything, and make sure that there is no constriction points. Have you ever and had a scenario? Go on. Uh, well, we haven't luckily, so not not encountered that. But we always just be worried about it. We mark where the vein loop is passing underneath. Make sure that we write there is no do not put any pressure here. Do not let the patient lean on the side. So we make sure that we have marked where the course of the AP loop as well as uh, the pedicle of the flap. So you've never had a situation where you've had to make a big long decision and then find that the AP loop is exposed and you have to start putting no. skin flaps or doing something no, I, crazy. I, I, I haven't had it yet. <laughs> I mean, I'm... I'm expecting that one will come soon, but we haven't had it yet. Have you had any problems with, with AB loops? And uh, when I used them, I, I did use them once on a low flow vessels, and yeah. they did not work well. So when I used them on low flow vessels, I had to take the flap back and change the plan into higher flow vessel. Okay, so you okay, fine. Um, and and how did that present itself? Was it just a kind of quite quite a pale? Just ischemic. Uh, so the went went flab went ischemic. So it was mottled. So we took the case back to theater. There was no flow in the graft. So we moved into from genicular vessels to superficial femoral vessels. And that was something you noticed intraoperatively or post op? No, it was uh, when we were in setting the flap. Oh, I see. So okay, so you identified it really quite early. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's cool. yeah. Have you had a situation where you have a flap that's okay, but that your uh, Doppler is not picking up a signal? You mentioned that it can be slow to pick up, yes. but what about not picking yeah. up at all, but the flap looks okay? It, it, or... it did happen. Once we leave it for a couple of hours, it does pick up. So the flap looks okay, bleeding from the edges. We leave a bit long on the end of the flap and we cut that at the end of the case when we're in setting and it's bleeding fine. So we leave it for a couple of hours afterwards and that picks up quite long. Are you talking about an um, indwelling Doppler? Are you, do you... No, no, the Doppler signal on the... External Doppler? Uh, external Doppler, yes. Doppler. We, don't, we, we don't use uh, flow couplers or indwelling uh, in our practice. We don't have much experience with them. Although when we tried the flow couplers for a couple of cases, it's again a bit of a learning curve. We had one case that there was no sound coming out of it, but luckily we had the rev in theatre with us and he told us just wait on it for a bit and that will pick up after a while. Okay, question from Ian King. Um, do you use any venous imaging? No, we don't. I would be keen to know if there is uh, what, what uh, venous imaging would be recommended to use and what benefit for it. But no, we, we don't so have experience with it. They've that. occasionally found occult venous occlusions, which can be a nuisance. Have you had any experience of that? Uh, not really, no. So not, not with, as in the, in the recipient vessels. Yeah. Is that into that? Uh, we had a case that developed a DVT postoperatively and had flap congestion. Then we changed plan from deep vein into a superficial vein when the second flap and that worked. So we had we had that experience with the DVT, but we did not preempt it. So we did not know beforehand that there was a DVT. We did not do any scans beforehand. Okay, so so let's say you're not doing an AV loop. You're just doing a straightforward. Um, Trauma free flap. Um, yep. Do you, in terms of what's your philosophy in terms of the venous outflow? Do you go for um, superficial or deep, or do you do both? Do you do, I, do you do? I, I always go for a deep, and normally I do one vein, but recently we started doing a second vein just for training purposes. So if the flap has two veins, I would do the first and uh, out here and vein, and then the junior 
member of the team would do the second vein. So that's two vein accommodants, generally. Two vein accommodant, yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, Unless, of course, there's only one vein of accommodant, but yeah. Yeah. And we, we, you... all, we aim for the deep circulation mainly. Okay. And do you ever, if you had just one deep vein, would you go for a superficial one as well? Or? Uh, if there is a second vein in the flab and we have it in the field, yes, we would go for it. But lots of questions to oh, ask you. So we're branching uh, yeah, out our beyond main the reference uh... is deep system. Yeah, I don't mind. It. <laughs> so look, um, a very good question from anonymous attendee. If the AV loop is done as a single stage procedure, how is it more advantageous than two interpositional graphs given the short period of maturation? As I said, in that time that we leave it to run, that will first of all show if there is any leaks in the graft or not, because there is blood running through it. It will expand its size in that uh, time again it's running and will show you the untwisting of the vein. If you're using an interpositional vein graft, you will only find out once you start the circulation through the, the flap. So it gives you a bit of time to see that uh, change or untwisting uh, unfolding of the size and seeing if there is any leaks happening to it or not. Um, a couple of people have asked about the size of your arteriotomy. Can you say a little bit about that, how you decide on the side, size? As small as you can. As small so as it's, possible. Uh, yeah, yeah, as small as possible. So we, we don't use any uh, instrument, any specific instrument. We do it with uh, uh, micro scissors. So just uh, grab a bit of full thickness to avoid uh, a V-shaped cut and then transverse cut just to do as small arteriotomy as you can. Do you think it can be too small? Uh, no, because it widens up once you put the sutures in. So once you start putting the stitches in, that will widen that. Up. As long as it, there is a flow coming out of it, of course. Or it's not too small that there is not much flow coming out of it. Um, somebody's asking about pseudo aneurysms at the site of anastomosis. Is that a concern? Is that something you've any experience of? No. Oh. I never had that experience, so we I would worry about delaminating, for example, if there is a patient with uh, severe um, uh, calcification, so it's delaminating the wall, but we did not have that experience, so I'm not the best expert to speak about that, to be honest. So, Ahmed, you, you talked about um, lower lateral, um, distal lateral defects. Can you just yes. expand on that a little bit, because that, that's always slightly tricky, isn't it? So we, our preferred recipient vessels generally is a posterior tibial. Mm -hmm. So even if we have a lateral defect, we would tunnel the pedicle underneath or super, more superficial between the deep posterior and superficial posterior compartment and pass it into the PTA and do the anastomosis on it. If we are using a short pedicle flap, we might need to use a vein loop at this point. Yeah, okay. So can you tell say, say a bit more about the um, um, the AV loop there. So in this case, it will be most probably a free one because we don't have lens of the long, uh, long softness, and right. we will do an end to end on the one of the vena committant and end to side on the BTA and pass that still in the plane between the deep and superficial posterior compartment, and that will be the recipient vessel for us. That's an end to end one. Uh, so so end to end. So yeah. So you you can't do that on a single vessel in you you're sacrificing the yes. people on you okay yeah yeah so we'll do an end to side on, on it if we need to yeah can you elaborate on that the positioning so you said you go through the posterior compartment so you're going deep to the Achilles any further so, yeah between between the Achilles and the deep posterior compartment. So yes. not between the Achilles and the fascia, so between the Achilles and the deep posterior compartment, so more uh, anterior to the Achilles. Any other technical tips on that, like in terms of the, do you try to sort of twist the vessel round so that it's got a sort of uh, inset that's smooth and not kinked or? So we, we try to, of course, yeah, the, it's quite, yeah, I think it's when, when we're setting it up, we try to make sure it has a nice curve on it, not much tension. And we most probably in this situation, will try to partially inset the flap to have a, an actual estimation of the length of the pedicle at this point. 
So how do you then um, plaster the the, um, the leg at this point and what do you put them on to stop yeah, any it, compression? It's, yeah, it's just the back slab and try to make it not contact with the skin. So it's mainly just holding the ankle in the neutral position and try to do a lot of padding around it. Because okay. I, I, I remember talking to David Wallace about a similar kind of thing and he makes a huge, gigantic break around <laughs> which no one can get close to. to um, just to be in a way to allow us to monitor it and not put any pressure either medially or laterally in the same manner as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, we, have, we have a question from um, one of our trainees, Alistair Reed, about your anticoagulation regime. Uh, do you use anything afterwards or is it just prophylactic? No, so we uh, prophylactic postoperatively with uh, for uh, if, if the patient is not high risk, so uh, enoxaparin or trixan postoperatively. Uh, we are in washout solution. We use 25,000 units in 500 mils of wash in intraoperatively. And we only give intraoperative heparin or heparinization if it's a high risk patient. What's a high risk patient to you? A patient had a previous DVT, multiple comorbidities, um, heart problems, or if they are prone to thrombosis in, in, in a way. And, and so when you say you give IV heparin, you, you mean what, 5,000 units? One shot, right? 5,000 units and yeah. properties. Yeah, that's what we do as well. What about salvage cases then? So if you've taken a flat back for salvage, is that something that might make you consider giving anticoagulation? Uh, what we must not necessarily blaming, it depends on the cause of the salvage. If the flap is being, um, Again, uh, compromised because of the of a thrombosis problem, we will give the patient anticoagulant. But if it was a technical error, or has a problem in the anastomosis, or we caught the back wall, not necessarily. For example, we would we would use a uh, anticoagulation for that. I mean, just going back to one of the cases you shared towards the end, I think you showed a um, ALT flap that was a arterial flow through flap. I think. Why did you have to do that there? Were there no other vessels or? Just no, well, we, we were using that and the vessel was in the vicinity. As I said, it's one of the least uh, uh, indication for me to use. So we don't normally need to reconstruct the PTA if the vessel is, if the leg is otherwise vascularized. Oh, but right. was it there, there was the, the lens of it was good enough for the bypass. And because they had, the patient had already a previous uh, vein graft. So there was a segment already cleaned and excised, so we just did it for this indication, but not, not routine practice for us. Oh, right. If we have a, an injured PTA, we would use it as an end-to-end -end anastomosis, and that's it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so John. Uh, so, oh, this, so we could ask, we, this, the, the questions are pouring in, and we should be coming for more, so we're very aware there's a lot of, we're trying to get as much as we can out of you. Um, I just wanted to ask about, um, I mean, there was so much in your talk that we've concentrated on the venous loop, but we haven't really even got onto the flow through flap yet. But with the flow through flap, do you tend to have a surgical plan that you're going to do it and then it goes very smoothly? Because I think there are certain challenges with the inset or have you have a situation where you thought, oh, it would be a nice idea to do that, but you haven't quite managed to technically make it work. Just interested to hear a bit more about your experience with flow through flaps. So with, with our experience with the flow through flaps, we we planned for it extensively because uh, the receiving vessels were limited in this case. We needed to make sure that we have in the limb that we have a good actual vessel. So we started with one flap first to make sure that we can actually get a decent length of a vessel to, to, to make it a flow through. Uh, but we also have a backup option. If we cannot do that, are we going to use a interpositional graft or we're going to do a bypass at this point? So it, it did have a bit of planning. And as I was, we were having a discussion in advance, we always work as a team. So two team approach was for us thinking about what we're going to do and what's the next step. It's not a common case that we would be doing a flow through in each every single day. It's one of these situations that would happen and will this was, will be one of the cases that will take most of the day for us because of the extensive planning for it. Tell us a bit about your, we were talking a bit about this offline, but um, just um, about joint operating. 
So joint operating have become more and more of a standard practice for us, especially after COVID. So my colleague, Ned Marsden and I, when we started working together in the Aswanzi, we started doing all our flaps together. We find it's more fun, more enjoyable. Each one of us is concentrating on one part of the procedure. It gives us a chance to focus on this part and also to train. Because if I'm taking a trainee through flap raising, then he can take another trainee or same trainee through the anastomosis. And on the next day or the next case, we would switch roles. I'll be doing the micro, he'll be doing raising the flap. It's quite enjoyable, speed things up and uh, help with the decision making. Especially when you have the same wavelengths and you're working together for a bit of time, you know exactly what you are doing. You don't need to speak in theater. We know each, each one of us have that part and they're doing it. Can I ask you a question about your personalities? Do they complement each other as well? Do you have differences that you find one of you will work in a certain way that works well or oppositely to the, to the other? How does, is there a dynamic there that works for you particularly? I think it did help that we both worked before Impress to work together beforehand and I think we got along. So that helped that we knew once we're starting our consultant post that will help us in our practice. Uh, we generally get on with, so with, with the same training that we had, we have the same ideas and we have so, same sorts. So that again, helped us to establish, yep, we know what we're both doing the same approach. So that's quite helpful for us. We'll be doing the same thing. Not sure if he's around and listening to us, but he's uh, listening. Yeah, so he's saying all the right things. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> he 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 is uh, he's more dynamic than me, more more uh, approachable than me. So I'm the quiet one. He would be the one who's doing all the chaos in theatre. Is that fair enough, Nick? <laughs> <laughs> what about the other team? So do you find that having the same scrub team is very important, and is that something you manage to achieve in Swansea? Definitely, but we did not manage to achieve. When we have the same team or a, a team that comes in quite frequently, they know what we want, we know what how we we operate. They're very hand, a handful or a very handy for us. But uh, when we have a new team, it's really difficult. We have to explain everything from the start. So it's not consistent, unfortunately, in Swansea. And it's something that we would hope that we have a regular and East East regular club uh, staff because that helps a lot with, with the brands. Any other questions about flow throughs? Uh, it's a question about Tissil. Do you use Tissil with your AV no, loops or any no. other anastomosis? No, 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 not at all. I didn't have any experience with it at all. What about uh, length? Uh, Marie Song has asked a question about length of the AV loop. Um, have you ever been in a situation where you found it's not long enough? Uh, yes, we did. Uh, and I think at this point, because the flap is not raised at this point, once you do the AV loop, you can decide on how long you need your pedicle on, or if you will need to change a plan for another flap with an even longer pedicle. So that's why we start with an AV loop to have an idea how far we will reach into and how maximum length of that. And having that running in the background or in the start of the case would be very helpful. Any technical tips on just um, raising that, the loop? You mentioned about the tip you learned from the vascular surgeon about not yes. tunneling it. Any technical pearls you can give to us in our audience? You, using vessels, so handling the vessels, always use vessel loops. So every incision, just find the segment of the vein, just go around it, put a vascular loop and use that to handle the vessel instead of grabbing it multiple times so don't cause multiple trauma. Uh, using smaller incision, as I said, than leaving skin bridges. Unfortunately, I makes the dissection a bit more difficult, but avoids wound complication in the future. And contraindications for you of using a loop? We didn't, we wouldn't, we haven't encountered anything that we would consider a contraindication, but of course, trauma in the same leg or at vessel being obviously injured or being involved in the trauma, we try to avoid it. Varicosities? We haven't encountered that, so we didn't, none of our cases had obvious varicosities to, to, to experience that. But let's say if someone didn't have an LSV available. 
well, you have the you can use veins from the upper limb, which might be a bit more actually size appropriate. So um, cephalic vein, for example, that can be. So I think I use that once for head and neck case yeah. as a free AV loop. Mm. Because it Great. gave us a quite a nicer ma match. Yeah. And uh, there, there's a comment from a um, from an, a delegate who said, this is a wonderful talk, plenty of surgical pearls that's worth re um, revisiting. Is it possible the recording be shared with the attendees? And of course, yes, um, Ahmed very possible. kindly agreed to yeah, that. Very happy. Um, but let me just echo that, I mean, it's wonderful to um, hear you talk about this. You know, we're so pleased to have you on our, on this um, stone mantle plastics. You're such a gifted surgeon and you're clearly very passionate about this topic. So thank you very much for, co for coming on. Th thank thank, you. thank you. you very much for having so, me. Can we, as we're kind of coming to the end and we've asked you very many quick fire questions, can I just finish by asking you, so for a microsurgeon who's considering uh, loop venous loop for the first time what are the things that you would vocalize that would help them to get the best possible result what do you think are the important things to take into consideration i think for me it was uh, the high flow vessels so just getting into high flow vessel to make sure that you have constant stream of flow of blood through that uh, loop that will keep it open for a while and will keep a flow circulating for it and not causing any thrombosis. So my main my main tip was was to use high flow vessel. Don't start using it on a smaller vessel or posterior tibial vessel or anterior tibial vessel. Use it on a high flow vessel right away. And do you think it's a technique that could be used for other areas, say like on the back maybe or for perineum? Or so we used in breast for slab salvages when we had a short pedicle, we had to claim part of it. So it was quite handy to get, out, to get us out of troubles. Uh, in head and neck, very useful. Don't do head and neck personally, but seen being used several times. Uh, I think, yes, it's a getaway of the zone of injury and give you a length of pedicle, give you a lot of freedom, makes your anastomosis much more easier uh, for the flab. And I, I think it, it's a a technique that I, do, I have a low threshold of using. So whenever I see a situation that I will have to use it, I will go for it right away. Great. Well, thank you very much once again. Uh, I think the take home message is high flow vessels. <laughs> Amazing talk. It's very inspiring. Thank you ever so much for coming on. Today. Thank you very much. And thank, thank you everyone you for much. joining in. We'll have to